If you have a Bible, please open it to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. The notes are in the bulletin. And if you don't have a Bible, the text is printed on the back of the bulletin. And for some of you who are wondering what translation I was reading from last week, that is a quite valid question. It was the CSV accidentally. In my Bible software, you have to pick one. And I'd switched earlier in the week to something, and the one right above ESV is the CSV. And so I, too, was partway through wondering, what is this? It's a good translation, which is good. It's a, good, it's, a, it's a sound translation, but we're back in the ESV this morning, I assure you. Um, okay, Luke chapter 20, verses 20 to 26. And I'll remind you that all of chapter 20 through the beginning of 21, and all the way through to the end of 21... I've titled The Conflict in the Temple. It's, it's Luke's account of the Passion Week. Jesus enters Jerusalem at the end of 19, and by the beginning of 22, he's preparing for the Last Supper with the disciples. And so, whereas Mark and Matthew give us some delineation on what happens on what days, for Luke, it's simply he's in the temple teaching. Um, this is what Jesus is doing. And so there's conflict with his adversaries. And this is the third part of six conflicts. Three are instigated by his enemies, and three are instigated by Jesus. So this morning we look at the third, and the second instigated by his foes. If you'll remember, it began with them coming and challenging him, asking by what authority he did these things. He asked them a counter question about the uh, baptism of John the Baptist. And they copped out. They said, we don't know. He said, well, neither am I going to answer you. And then he proceeded to tell the parable of the vineyard owner and the murder of his son. And you read in verse 19 of chapter 20, the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So now they'll come up with another approach, and this morning we'll look at the issue of Caesar and God, or Caesar or God. Um, Let's begin our time by reading the text, verses 20 through 26. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, teacher... We know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's, he said to them. Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able, in the presence of the people, to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answers, they became silent. Lord God, as we behold this conflict between the would-be religious leaders of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you would give us eyes to behold his glory, his fierce, unashamed, uncowardly speaking of the truth that confounds his enemies. Help us to see the glory of our Savior. Help us to see the evil of these men, and help us to learn what you would have for us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at this text, we're going to look at it in four points. A wicked plot is hatched in verse 20. A cunning trap is set. Verses 21 through 22, an apt answer is given, 23 to 25, and Jesus' foes are defeated. And remember, there's two primary things we're to see here. The most primary is Jesus, again, defeating his enemies. Notice how this passage ends. They became silent in verse 26, which anticipates verse 40. They no longer dared ask him any question. Jesus is going to be 6-0 at the end of this conflict. 6-0, total defeat. And so we see them. Luke is unmasking their, their, their hypocrisy, their deceit, their deception, their dishonesty, their corrupt motives. And we're seeing the glory of our Lord. The wicked flee where no one pursues. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Jesus is as bold as a lion. 
And additionally, the particular topic that they're going to ask him about, about one's allegiance to the state, one's obligation to the state, is also of interest for us. So the primary thing we're seeing, Jesus defeating his foes, that's the conflict in the temple, the the particular topic of discussion, one's allegiance, relationship to the governing authorities. So let's dive in. A wicked plot is hatched. And Luke gives us the, the circumstances surrounding this encounter. Verse 20. They watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. Now, we just seen in verse 19 that when Jesus completed his parable of the vineyard owner, they wanted to lynch him. They wanted to lay hands on him. What's the thing that stops them from that? They fear the people. He is popular. We've seen that there are vast crowds of people getting up early in the morning, coming to hear him teach. They they can't just lynch him. So now they shift their plan. They wanted to lay hands on Jesus. So now they send spies who pretend to be sincere. That word for pretend is the Greek word hypokritomai, which we get the word hypocrite from. It's a concept of pretending to be one thing. It actually comes out of the theater in Greek. The, the, The actors wear masks. The happy mask, the sad mask. And underneath the mask, you might look entirely different. You present yourself one way in reality or another. There's an irony here. Because these spies are going to come and speak truth to Jesus. What they speak about Jesus is true. They just don't mean it. They're insincere. They're hypocrites pretending to be sincere. And now they've shifted their goal slightly. Before they want to lay hands on Jesus, now in verse 20. It was to catch him in something he said. Literally, it translates to lay hold of Jesus' words. So they can't lay hands on him. The people are there. They fear the people. So then the next best thing to directly lynching Jesus is to catch him in something he says to trap him. So that's their shift in focus. And particularly with a goal to hand him over to the Roman governor. The Roman governor. Governor, and you see that that they wanted to deliver him up to the authority and the jurisdiction of the governor, and they want Rome to do their dirty work for them. That would be an ideal situation. If he's so popular with the people, wouldn't it be great? They reason if we could somehow get Rome to take him out, and then the outcry from the people wouldn't be directed against us. Hey, Rome did it, so that's their plan. Now, the Roman governor, we know back in uh, Luke chapter three. Because Luke very helpfully gives us very astute time dates. And when Jesus begins his ministry, when John the Baptist begins his ministry, we get this in Luke 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So that's the Caesar who's in office, Tiberius. Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. So specifically, they want Pilate to take him out. That will be their plan. And to some degree, they will have some measure of success with it. And they're hoping for Rome to do their dirty work. Tiberius is Caesar. Pilate is the governor of Judea. And so they send in these spies. Now again, notice notice just the hypocrisy. These are the religious leaders. These are the moral people. And they, literally the word is hired spies. They send spies. And these spies are dishonest. They pretend to be one thing. And I think the logic is, if Jesus sees us coming... He, he'll be on his guard, but if he doesn't see us coming, maybe he'll let his guard down and make a mistake. And they're getting kind of desperate. So they send in these spies, pretending to be disciples. And then we move on to the trap that is set. And first, the spies attempt to flatter Jesus. Again, if you want to let, get someone's guard down and you're corrupt, flattery is a good, well, at least it's a, it, it, it gets the job done in many cases. It's not good, it's wicked. And so first they they flatter him. They call him teacher, a respectful title. And what do they ascribe to him? Well, teacher, you speak and teach rightly. You show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Now the irony here is this. They are saying this insincerely. They don't mean it. It's gospel truth. And so there's an irony here that is set up. It's even doubly ironic because what do they flatter him with? They flatter him that he teaches the way of God rightly and that he shows no partiality. Literally, he doesn't receive a face. But the entire thing they're trying to do is flatter him in the hopes that he will receive them. I mean, 
It's like, it's like flattering someone by telling them that they're not easily flattered. That's what they're doing. It's, it's, it's ironic. The reader's supposed to see is the double corruption in this. Oh, teacher, we know that you don't respect one person over another, that you just speak what is true, and you're not afraid of the powerful. You, you don't receive a face. You show no partiality. And this, of course, is what's required of a righteous judge. Jesus has come in, heralded as Israel's king. And so it is right and fitting. He, he does teach what is right. He does show no partiality. And what they're trying to do is set him up because they want him to take on Rome. You're not afraid of anybody, teacher. You, you just say it like it is. You speak the truth. We love that about you. You're not afraid. You don't, you don't cower before the strong man. And then they give them their question. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? The spies next attempt to entrap Jesus. So first they flatter him. That's what they try to do. It fails. And then the trap. That's an interesting question. They don't ask, must we give tribute to Caesar? Is it lawful? In every other instance in Luke's gospel, this question is, is the Mosaic law, does the Old Testament allow? So they're accusing Jesus of doing things on the Sabbath that are not lawful. And so what they're proposing is this question that it might be against the Bible and against the law of Moses for them to pay tribute to Caesar. That's interesting. What could their rationale be? Well, I I can imagine along a couple of lines. The first is, to whom does Israel belong? Israel is the Lord's, right? we're We're not the subjects of Rome, we're the subjects of the Lord. And nothing in the Mosaic law tells you to pay tribute. You pay, you pay your tribute to the king, and you pay your, your tax to the temple. There's nothing in the law about paying f- pagan foreign rulers. But more to the point, this particular tribute, which interestingly enough, was only, as far as we can tell, instituted just a few years previously. The census that sent Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem was the setup for this tribute. But this tribute was paid directly to Caesar, Whereas the, the, the money that the tax collectors got from you eventually channeled their way to the Roman government, the tribute was a small amount, one denarius, a day's wage, but it was you giving it directly to Caesar. And so a secondary argument might be something along the lines of, this is a pagan man who set himself up to be worshipped as a false god. I, I cannot support that. I can't participate in that. And additionally, Rome does all sorts of wicked practices and policies. My money would be approving and supporting of that. My conscience won't let me participate in that. And so I'm not sure what their reasoning is, but you can imagine things like that. Uh, Nowadays, you can even hear similar arguments from people. You know, my, my government, our government has policies I don't approve of, and I don't want my money to support that. Well, I certainly don't want my money supporting policies I don't approve of, but it's a similar type of argument to what they have here, I think. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar, Tiberius? And so they've actually learned something from Jesus. Last time they came to him, they asked him an open-ended question. From from where did you receive this authority? Who gave it to you? And Jesus pinned them on the horns of a dilemma, a yes-no question. John's baptism, from heaven or from man? Well, what have they done here? They're trying to do the same thing. Again, they, they fail pitifully, but they're, 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 they're learning, at least. And so here's the dilemma Jesus faces in answering this question. He risks alienating either the zealots or Rome. And not even just the zealots, but all the people. Because I mean, think about it. They're expecting a messianic king. As Jesus was leaving Jericho and going to Jerusalem, he told them a parable precisely because they thought the kingdom of God was about to appear. He's come in and identified himself as a king. And what are they expecting Israel's Messiah king to do? To cast off the Roman oppressor. So king, Jesus, do we have to pay these pagan rulers directly, and what they're hoping he's going to do, we we know what answer they hope he's going to give. They hope he's going to say, of course not. I'm your king. If you're going to pay tribute, pay it to me. We're going to muster up an army. We're going to whoop up on them. That's the logic. Um, One commentator says this, the resulting portrait of Jesus is places him in a vice between Pilate and the people. If Jesus answers one way, he stands condemned by Rome as a dissident. And the other He depletes his capital with the people. And remember, what was the very reason they were afraid to lay hands on him? 
people. So from his enemy's perspective, the best case scenario is he speaks out against Rome. He's a political dissident, guilty of treason, and Rome will take him out. By the way, this is exactly what they charge him with at his mock trial. Turn, turn to chapter 23, 2. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. This is a bold-faced lie. First they try to get him to say it, then even though he doesn't say it, well, we'll just say he said it anyway, right? That's, that's the rationale and the logic. So, Jesus is stuck between either offending Rome or weakening his support from the people. The people are expecting him to be a Messiah who's going to deliver them from Rome, but if he says, no, no, pay Rome, that expectation that he's going to cast Rome off weakens, and the very thing that prevents them from laying hands on him weakens. So that's still a good outcome from their point of view. Best case scenario, he says, no, it's not lawful. But if he says, yes, pay your taxes to Caesar, that'll weaken his support from the people, so at least that's a still a good outcome. That's where they think they've got him. That's the trap that he is in. And we see that as well at the end in verse 26. They were not able to catch him. They were not able, sorry, in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. And you see how this, this section is bookended by catching him. The first in 20, catching him to deliver it to the governor. But they, they don't get to do that. They don't even get to catch him in front of the people. They're going to they're gonna fail. So that's the dilemma. He risks alienating either the people, the zealots, or Rome. Okay? So, now our Lord gives his answer. It's marvelous. And first Luke tells us that Jesus is not deceived. He is not easily flattered. He spots their craftiness. He perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius whose likeness is. And inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So first, Jesus spots their guile. He's, he's not deceived. This is good to know. If you have a Lord and a ruler and a God, it's nice to know he's not easily duped. He's not buttered up by flattery. You see, the, the, the tremendous irony is that precise threat, he doesn't receive a face. He doesn't show favoritism or partiality. And so even when they flatter him, it doesn't work. He sees what they're up to. And as is so often Jesus' custom, he asks a counter question first. Go through the Gospels and see how often Jesus responds to a question with a question. He just did that before when they challenged him his authority. Where did you get this authority? He says, let me ask you a question. Or teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's your reading of the law? So often Jesus counters a question with a question. And here, he asks an odd question. He says to them, show me a denarius. That's interesting. Denarius is is, not a terribly large sum of money, about roughly a day's wage in that day and era. Um, So the real issue isn't the exorbitant fee to Caesar, but the notion of approving, solidifying his rule, acknowledging that you're under a foreign rule. I mean, the Jews in John 8 tell Jesus, we've never been enslaved by anyone. I mean, they live in this sort of, this bizarro, false world. You know, nobody except the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Syrians and the Medo-Persians and the Romans and the Greeks, apart from that, nobody's ever enslaved us. And so Jesus asked them to show him a denarius. And this is really, really shrewd of our Lord. And I hope you'll see why in a moment. And then, one of these people who've questioned him pulls out of the denarius, presumably. He says, okay, whose likeness and inscription does it have? And then they give the obvious answer, Caesar. And then Jesus gives his astounding answer, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So what's, what's going on here? I, I want you to get this, because this is brilliant of our Lord. His, his enemies are basically, I think, to some degree asking, is it right of us to participate in, to approve, to accept this pagan false god as our political ruler? 
And what Jesus, I think, is in effect saying is, you got his money in your pocket, you already have. You already have. That's a pretty seizure-ish coin you got there. You, did you receive that? Do you buy and sell with coins that have Caesar's face on it? Oh, you do? Well, then, don't you really kind of have an answer to your question? <laughs> I mean, it's not like these people around, you know, like living like the Essenes, trying to remove themselves from society. No, they, they're, they're playing Caesar's game. They'll take Caesar's money, and they'll spend Caesar's money. One, one commentator puts it this way, um, Daryl Bach. By producing this coin, they indicate that they carry on with trade with it, They are, after all, lovers of silver. They use these coins without blinking an eye. Thus, the question's edge is lost in their daily practice. They live in the state and freely use its currency. Another commentator writes this. By requesting from the denarius, Jesus exposes the nature of their question, since it is clear that they who possess denarii also possess their own answer to the question they've just posed. What is more, in the discourse that immediately follows, Jesus, in essence, charges them, together with the Sanhedrin, with being about the business of Rome rather than about the business of God. See, they've they've already accepted Roman rule because they're using Roman coins. If they want to be consistent with that argument, they'd have to do something else. But no, they take Roman money and they spend Roman money. So it's not an issue of whether or not you accept Caesar as your governor, as your lord, politically speaking. They already have. They're in his system. They're playing his game. And they've got the money on them. And he's got his stamp all over it. It's got his face on it. It's got his inscription on it. He's claimed it as his. It's interesting. And so his response then is, and and the the, uh, ESV here actually doesn't, well, hmm. Render Literally, they ask, do we give didomi? And then there's a Greek word didomi. And then they put a a a preposition on the front of it. It means to repay, to give back, literally. Apa didomi. And so he says, give back to Caesar. Caesar's already marked it, stamped it as his. So, So give it back to him when he asks for it. And give back to God the things that are God's. And here we have Jesus' clear teaching our fundamental obligation to render unto the human authorities that which is due them. We, we can't claim some sort of high spiritual holiness that we can't do this because we're somehow participating in. My, my, I live in a heavenly Jerusalem. I have a king in heaven. Yes, that's all true. That doesn't in any way wipe out or erase your obligation to civic society and the state that you live in. In fact, I'd like to turn to Romans 13. I know that this is going outside the scope of Luke, but the Apostle Paul uses nearly identical language, and he spells it out even more clearly. So for Jesus here, it's a tribute. Now, you and I are not likely to be called upon to pay a tribute, but lest you think, oh, well, then that, you know, that fulfills my obligation. Why don't you listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 13? And I want you to bear in mind who the governing authority is when Paul writes this. Almost certainly it's Nero. Okay? Let every person be subject, submissive, obedient, literally to place themselves under the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Paul's just saying God made Nero Caesar. God put him in place there. It's very similar to what Paul, what Jesus tells Pilate, you would have no authority unless my father gave it to you. The implication, God has given that authority to Pilate. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Rather than being super spiritual in your resisting of Nero, your scorning of Nero, you're actually resisting God. And those who resist will incur judgment. Now jump down to verse 5. He repeats the command again. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. And then that word, repay, 
It's right here in verse 7. Translated as pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. So if you want to summarize what our obligation is to human government, whether it be righteous government, wicked government, whether Nero's in charge, or whether you like our president, whether you don't like our president, whether you like Congress, whether you don't like Congress, it doesn't really matter. You're going to have a hard time arguing for a worse political leader than Nero. I mean, maybe Caligula, I mean, but he's got to be at the top of the list. And Paul says, we, we submit to them, and we pay taxes to them, and we give them honor, and we give them respect. And I'm guessing, if you're like me, you probably aren't likely to lie and cheat on your taxes. But the other aspect of, of respect and honor is much harder. But look what Paul says. Respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And that's difficult for us because we live in a country founded on revolution, We live in an age where Facebook and social media wants you to weigh in on what is your verdict? What is your judgment? What do you think about X? And the more outrageous, the more likes it usually gets, right? I think Facebook may rise up and condemn many of us for our failure to honor and respect our authorities. That doesn't mean we can't disagree with them, but we are to give honor to whom honor is due. And we can't cop out some spiritual answer because we're Christians, we're above and outside of these things. Turn, turn to Acts. I'll give you one radical example of this. Acts 23. It's remarkable. In Acts 23, looking intently at the council, verse 1, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you attack, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? So here's Paul, illegally beaten at a hearing. And he calls him on it, but he doesn't just call him on it. He also insults him, right? He doesn't just say that wasn't right. You whitewashed wall, God is going to strike you. They tell him, you're going to speak that way to the high priest? Look at his answer in verse 5. Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Paul takes this stuff seriously. And it can be challenging. Jesus doesn't address, well, what do you do if the things owed to Caesar and the things owed to God conflict and you have to choose? Well, the answer to that is simple. As the apostle said in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. If you have to really choose, if God says go left and man says go right, you go left. But turn to Daniel chapter 6. You still can obey God and disobey the governing authorities in a respectful way. And the book of Daniel is a remarkable example of how do you disagree with the authorities God has placed over you. Remember, Daniel has been kidnapped, castrated, given to the hands of the chief of the eunuchs. The chief of the eunuchs watches over eunuchs. That's why we're pretty convinced Daniel was castrated. He's never married, never has any kids. And he serves the king faithfully. And in chapter 6, officials want to trap him. And they can't trap him in anything they do. He does. So they say in verse 5, Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. And they know he's got this custom of praying. And then they go flatter the king. And he is easy to be flattered. They get him to make a foolish law. And look at verse 10. What does Daniel do? When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks for his God. Now, this is bold. This isn't even fully commanded. It's a pattern laid out in Scripture, praying for Jerusalem, towards Jerusalem. And Daniel could have said, I'll still pray. I'll just pray in my heart because the, the law forbid for a month praying to anyone other than the king and his God. 
But he knows that if he stops his custom, his enemies will conclude Daniel's faithfulness to his God has faltered. So no, he opens the windows publicly. He's bold. What he doesn't do is start a revolt. What he doesn't do is is start a campaign. He just disobeys. And when the king hears about it, the king punishes him. The king's sympathetic, but the king punishes him. And I want you to see how Daniel speaks to this king who made a foolish law and a wicked law, demanding people only pray and worship him. Look what Daniel says in verse 21. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. He's speaking to him respectfully. Even as he has disobeyed his law publicly, even as he has concluded, I must obey God, not you, he speaks respectfully and with honor to this foolish and wicked king. The book of Daniel gives us a great model for at those times where we must choose between obeying God and obeying man, how to go about obeying God in the most respectful way that we can. Okay, there's a lot more I could say about that, but we will move on. Look at the other half of Jesus' truism. So we are commanded, make no mistake, to give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. We're to give the money owed to Caesar, the respect owed to Caesar, the honor owed to Caesar. We can disagree. And in the country that we have here where we can vote, we have unprecedented ability to influence Caesar. And we can contest things if we don't think they're lawful. I'm not saying any of that's wrong. But the attitude of scorn and contempt that we pour out on our political leaders that we disagree with is is wicked, and it it sullies the name of Christ. Look at at Jesus before Pilate. Look at Daniel in Babylon. Models of how to disagree and even contradict in respect. Okay? So now the second half, because it's not just one thing. They're hoping Jesus would do either or. Either your loyalties with the state or your loyalties with God, and Jesus says both. Jesus says both. And there's an implicit argument here. Because the coin is stamped with the image and inscription of Caesar, give it back to him. And likewise, give back to God's what's God. So I want you to think for a moment, what is it that is stamped with God's image and likeness that's owed to God? Man, you and me. And what's inscribed on every one of our hearts with the evidence of the law? God's got his writing all over us, our image, his image all over us. And so Jesus is rebuking these people, not only do you need to give the things due to Caesar to Caesar, you need to give the things to God that are God's, and that's you. That's me. And there may be times where those things conflict, but when they don't, you can do both. You do both. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? Whose likeness and inscription do you have? Whose law is written on your heart? Um, hold on lost my quote. Well, we'll move on. So Jesus is indicating that as much as we can, we serve and give the respect to the human government, our, our honor, our respect, our money where it's needed, and we still give the totality of ourself to God. Give the totality of ourself to God. That's his answer. He doesn't choose either or. It's the both and. Here, I found the quote now. Edwards. Caesar and God vie for ultimate authority in the political and religious climate of Jesus' day. There's this tug of war of who are you going to be loyal to, Caesar or God. Yet Jesus presumes to speak for both. That ultimate authority resided with God is clearly implied in Jesus' usage of image, the same word used in Genesis 1.26 of humanity's creation in God's image. If coins bear Caesar's image, then they belong to Caesar. But the same verb is also applied with reference to God. Humanity bears God's image. Humanity must therefore render ultimate submission to the God in whose image it is made. So that's Jesus' answer. You give, you give back the Caesar-ish coins, Caesar-ish coins to Caesar, and you give the things stamped with God's image their honor and respect that God is owed, which means all of life, all of you. That's Jesus' amazing answer. It's apt. And look at the effect with the few minutes we have left. 
They were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. Jesus' foes are defeated. So first thing to note, their plan has utterly failed. Now remember, what was their goal number one? Get him in hot water with Rome. That didn't work. Jesus just told them to pay. What was the backup plan? Well, at least in the presence of the people, we'll, we'll decrease his power base. They, they'll get to understand he's not going to free Israel. He's, he's a sellout to the state. No, that didn't work either. Notice how they, they were not able to catch him in what he said in the presence of the people. No, Jesus' esteem in the people's eyes only is raised with his answer. They, they failed utterly. That's why they're just going to lie in chapter 23. They're just going to lie and say he said it anyway. Next, even as that, and this is what's so amazing about our Lord and his, his glory and his wisdom, even the people who hate him, even people who are pretending to be his disciples have to marvel at the wisdom of his answer. They marvel at it. Jesus is the living word of God. And from the first time he began teaching back in chapter four where the people at his hometown who also hated them and they tried to throw him off a cliff, they marveled at the wise words coming out of his mouth. Even here, Jesus' enemies have to recognize the wisdom in what he said. He just owned them, completely owned them. They marvel at his answer, and they become silent. There's only one more attempt from Jesus' enemies to try to trap him coming. The Sadducees who are waiting in the wings, they don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. They're going to give it one shot. They're going to give it one more shot. And then we're going to read verse 40 of Luke 20. They no longer dared ask him anything. This is their second attempt, and it fails. Jesus is now 3-0. He's he's defeating them. And his words, even as he defeats them, they marvel at his answer. I, I love this. The power, the glory of our Savior. So as we transition now to a time of communion, I just call on you to first and foremost marvel, revel in the glory of your Savior, this brave, fearless Son of God who is God, who speaks the truth, who destroys his enemies. And also remember that you have civic earthly obligations, and as much as it depends on you, fulfill them, both in money and respect, but also recognize that you and I are stamped with God's likeness, his laws written in our hearts, and ultimately we're his possession. We to repay to him what is owed. We have a great Savior. Let's, let's pray as we prepare to transition to communion. Lord God, um, how great is our Savior. How marvelous is the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, his enemies conspire and they lie, and they flatter, and they scheme, and he undoes them. Oh, Lord God, give us that boldness. Give us that courage that we might speak the truth in love unafraid, not receiving a face, rightly laying out your word. We live in a day and age where to do so is to heap scorn upon ourselves. Let us, like our Lord, be unafraid and bold. And Lord, as we were reminded uh, that we are yours, you made us, your image is stamped upon us, we need to give back to you what is due, which is all of our love, mind, work. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, being. And Lord, also help us to, in faith, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, that we would not begrudge and grumble at that, but view it as an act of obedience and worship to you. Give us the wisdom to know when we must disobey Caesar, and give us the, the humility to do it respectfully, um, to do it giving as much honor as we can to him, knowing that there is no authority on earth except what you have given. You have placed our leaders in their place. You have placed every leader in the world. You are the king of kings, and your throne is above all thrones. And that is why we do not fear. In Jesus' name, amen.